yeah yeah got it yeah just uh, hope the audio quality is good and everything but no um everything's great uh okay ben good welcome to the hacking state podcast thank you for having me and nice to meet you alex and to answer your question about what the history is well you know i don't even want to <clears throat> i mean i i worked on i was working on ukbar for a while Mm which was a layer two Ethereum rollup that was going to be built on Urbit. Um, but over the course of building that, and we did end up building a, a layer two that was functional, was rolling up to Ethereum. We were in the testnet phase when we kind of realized that the operating system wasn't going to serve that purpose well. So we, I mean, there was a bunch of technological changes that happened right around that time or the technological changes may have happened even earlier, but we took a little while to realize that they had happened. I mean, two important ones I would say were the ability of AI like tools to generate code and then what had been done with Wasm web assembly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, AI code gen was pretty like influential actually in the, in the way that this project got started keynote. And I think it is relevant to the conversation, but not in the way that like, you know, people talk about, like, for example, over the past couple of weeks, like I've seen a lot of stuff on Twitter about cursor and like how good it is. Yeah. People are like realizing this for the first time, but that tool, I mean, that, that IDE has been out for like a year and it's mm. not the only way that people generate code when they're, when they're, you know, writing code. I think most software engineers are using some sort of AI, like autocomplete, right? Whether mm. it's copilot or something more sophisticated, like, it's a, it's uh, gives you a lot of leverage to do stuff. So at the time we were working in a language that didn't have any of that ability because it was an esoteric language, right? The, the mm -hmm. urbit you know, language stack. Um, so that we didn't even notice how big of a deal it was until we started experimenting with other languages and, and saw how much leverage we could get out of it. But that's actually not the part that was like super influential. The part that was super influential was um, how much research you could do with these tools in such a short period of time. Um, I mean, there were like ideas about networking and like ideas about storage that we had thought about in the context of the old system that we were working in. Um, but then being able to have like a, literally like chat GPT to bounce ideas off of and get immediately like immediate like research level feedback and i know it's not right about stuff all the time like you, you'd have to be a fool to think oh it's like it's a genius right it gets stuff wrong but it's better than google <laughs> it's it's a lot better than google for digging in on like a research topic um and it really helps you if you know how to like be critical of what it says to to explore a topic very very quickly and get like a broad level view so you know where to specialize so as a research tool it's incredible so we used that and we realized okay like we need to build a wasm a wasm based peer-to-peer -peer operating system and then we did that with with these tools uh pretty quickly sorry that was a pretty big tangent into that specific subject but um i guess i should uh zoom out and talk about what keynote is <laughs> yeah so 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 what is Keynote? My understanding is, you know, it's a decent, it's sort of a bunch of things. It's a decentralized operating system. It's a peer to peer, uh, you know, app framework. Um, and then there's also a node network. Um, and primarily the, the goal is to sort of simplify the development and, and deployment of decentralized applications. You, it's been called sort of a, a, a lamp stack for crypto. Um, so yeah. let's just get into what can node keynote is um and uh you know why why is such a tool kind of needed in the first place yeah good question good question i think starting with why is is important because um you know sometimes people uh like question like oh like you know infrastructure especially in crypto like oh why do you need more infrastructure um this this project comes from a very like um, specific desire that everybody that's been working on it, even in the Ukbar days, uh, feels very acutely because uh, each person who's like on the team right now, 
and even people who have been on the team in the past have all had like firsthand experience of trying to build apps for like users, like games and toys and social apps um, on like Ethereum or mm. just on, on like a smart contract blockchain. So we all kind of like, we're like students or like, you know, pretty, you know, new developers trying to do that stuff. And um, what's, becomes very clear very quickly when you do that is um, there's not a good way to build um, a, the back end of a crypto application. Um, and this is, I think, why people who are uh, negative, feel negative about crypto in general in the software world, which there are many, like many smart engineers in software who feel terribly about crypto. They don't like it. Mm. I think the reason, like the, the crux of it is that they see a bunch of people who are using like this one kind of niche tool, like the blockchain, mm. and they're treating it like it's like it's everything, right? They're treating it like it's their database and their server and their their distribution mechanism. And in traditional software, you have thousands of like tools and services that do those things for you. And each like subcategory has like competitors and it's like a very advanced field that you can specialize in. Mm. And that's that's for a good reason because each each kind of different thing has a different purpose like different tools do different things um so when you're building an app with with crypto basically none of the existing tools are are super useful for you because they're all designed with web 2 in mind you know like all every service offered in the aws like you know um swiss army knife of like options is is geared around you are a developer serving a client to a user over the web mostly mm -hmm. and then you're like serving them some back-end services um so like in crypto you have that client that you're serving to the user um but then that client is also like has a lot of business logic involved because everything else is just running out of a smart contract that's served on ethereum or somewhere else um and that leads to like really low quality apps, right? Um, the problem building apps like that is like every, um, you know, every long term interaction has to be run through that transaction mechanism on the blockchain, right? Um, and every time you do that, of course, it comes with a cost, hmm. um, and it comes with a period of latency. Right. And it's like a limited throughput action. Yeah. Right. And all of those are like terrible and people criticize them rightfully. So now I think that there's been plenty of research put into how to make the transactions cheaper and faster. Mm. I don't think scaling further on that front is going to make a big difference in the quality of apps because like, again, like as if you are a software engineer, if you're like study computer science, like it, scale in like the marginal sense doesn't matter so much as orders of magnitude and mm. like a blockchain that is serving many many users and applications is orders of magnitude away from like what you need out of like your sqlite database right that's running right. on a single server that you control right or even at the user's level right an individual user's database the scale is just, it's orders of magnitude different and they serve completely different purposes. Um, so getting back to the point, um, we found that there was not a good like way to build rich applications, right? Because all you have is the smart contract and then the, the browser app. So we all really want this backend, this general purpose backend for crypto apps. Mm. Um, and if you're building one of these things, like the peer to peer operating system architecture is a perfect fit because you already have nodes in the forms of, in the form of like a wallet, you know, mm -hmm. you are a user with a, with a wallet, um, you're signing transactions, you're broadcasting them yourself, ideally, right? You're reading from the chain yourself, ideally, you're running a light node or something, or you're getting somebody else to run it for you. That's fine too. So having a node that you run, like whether it's on a VPS somebody's running it for you or you're running it on your computer directly, it matches like the impotence of crypto interactions. Mm -hmm. So that's really nice. Um, and then it gives you all these off chain tools that you really need. So peer to peer messaging, storing data locally, running a SQLite database as the back end of your app is all really nice. Um, mm -hmm. So we, 
yeah, we basically built that um, sort of node runtime and then an application environment that executes in Wasm inside of that for developers to build these, you know, user space peer-to-peer -peer applications. Um, and why why WebAssembly? Why did you settle on Wasm? Yeah, so I mean, um, as as you noted, we we tried to do this with with Urbit and some of the goals of that computing environment um, are important. Um, so for one, like um, when you're running code on the client's machine, like there's sort of a higher burden of um, recoverability um, because you know uh, code running sort of at the at the edge is uh, is more vulnerable. It doesn't have like a technician or somebody that can SSH in and like fix stuff. So being able to say like, oh, this code is deterministic, that's nice. So Wasm has that property. Uh, there's <laughs> edge cases with floating point numbers in particular, but they're quite easily avoided. Um, and then the other thing is, um, as just as like a like a compilation target, uh, you have many languages, so it's accessible for developers to compile to. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, maybe most importantly, um, you can like bundle it and distribute it and execute it in a number of runtimes. So uh, we use in our in our nodes we use Wasm time, but there's like half a dozen uh, serviceable Wasm runtimes available for people. Um, so you can have this you know standardized um, compilation target that um, is capable of um, withstanding like client diversity. Um, mm -hmm. which is which is a nice property. So basically, yeah, it checks all these boxes for for peer-to-peer -peer computing. Um, so a lot of the same reasons that it runs in the in the browser, you know. Right. Yeah. Okay. That that makes sense. And then, uh, as far as like uh, the uh, application layer of this, like like how easy is it to build an application uh, right now? And like, what tooling do you guys have left to sort of fill out? Um, yeah. As far as you know, because you described in the beginning about how the the uh, the impetus for this project was that you know there were there were a bunch of engineers who who work at Keynote who had experience trying to build consumer facing uh, crypto apps and were very frustrated, you know, by this paradigm of, of everything needs to be a transaction on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious, like. How far is the development environment? Uh, how far have you guys um, gotten and, and what kind of things are people trying to build? Yeah, it's so um, pretty far. I mean, I'm biased, but I think it's I think it's very easy to build uh, applications in Keynote right now. Mm -hmm. So we've put we've put a lot of emphasis into like um, developer experience. So uh, for starters, like with Wasm, um, you can write a bunch of languages. You can write Keynote apps in a bunch of languages, um, but we've put all of our energy into Rust so far. So the reason for that is that it's sort of the most thoroughly supported language for Wasm. There's the most tooling available. Um, and we like Cargo as a package manager, package distribution tool. So. Uh, we built this tool called Kit um, mm -hmm. that is distributed with Cargo and helps you manage uh, your Keynote apps. So the developer experience for Keynote right now is that you Cargo install, well, you install Rust, right? Mm -hmm. And then you install this Cargo tool, Kit. And then Kit has like a series of commands that guide you through the process of like building an app and deploying it, all the way to deploying it on the Keynote network. Mm -hmm. um, so we modeled this after Forge, which is like this equivalent tool for Solidity and Ethereum. Mm. So, you know, kit new, you create a new project. We've got a series of templates that you can pull from blank, a chat app, right? A file transfer app. You pull these in, um, you have an optional web front end that you want to serve from Keynote. So that's usually written in JavaScript or TypeScript. So you get a template for that. You get a template for your Rust backend. Um, you have one, so it's a process-based architecture. So um, a given app can contain one to many processes. Mm -hmm. So you can do like, you know, uh, not, not multi-threaded per se, but multi-task. Um, mm -hmm. The process are managed with the Wasm runtime. So it, it may or may not be multi-threaded depending on what, the, what computer it's running on, right? But um, you can deploy some processes to the node. You can 
coordinate between multiple nodes. Of course, you've got your peer-to-peer -peer messaging primitives, file handling, HTTP client and server, all that stuff. Um, you can serve a web front end. Um, you can kit build, right? Build it. You can launch it on a fake virtual node that runs just on your computer in your development environment for testing mm -hmm. the interface, testing whether it compiles, all that good stuff. Um, you can deploy it to a node given like an like a, a, a URL and like a password and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, and then when you're ready to deploy it, you can like run kit deploy or kit publish. It's like a kit publish. Mm -hmm. And you know, given a wallet private key, you know, you can also go through a, a web UI to do this. Um, you get to publish it to the Keynote App Store package manager. So we have our own package manager that's inside the OS. Um, that's on-chain, peer-to-peer, uh, and then Kit lets you publish to that, and then people can just download your app and use it. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I what what yeah, what parts awesome. are then shared uh, as part of the peer-to-peer -peer component of the OS? Yeah, so basically um, we have a global general purpose namespace. Uh, mm. We call it EMAP. Um, and this is the like, yeah, I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's the it's the namespace of the operating system. Because like anytime you talk about like, okay, peer-to-peer -peer operating system or what decentralized operating system, the terminology is, it's difficult to, to pin down. Um, but you can also think of it as just one big operating system that a bunch of people are users of, right? Right. Uh, so you know, you're running this piece of software on your computer. I'm running it on mine. We have a shared namespace, right? Just like um, just like DNS provides. Mm. Uh, this namespace is uh, on on chain, right? So it's we have a beta staging namespace running on Optimism. Mm. Uh, we're gonna so the operating system is in beta right now. It's version 0 0.9. Um, when we launch the, you know, final release 1.0, uh, not beta, um, we'll probably put the namespace uh, somewhere else. But right now we have a staging namespace for the beta. Um, but the, the purpose will be the same. On-chain namespace. Uh, this stores like the node identities, but it also stores like arbitrary information that you want to be visible to all nodes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I there's more um, at play there, but I don't think I can get into it at this moment. Um, but we've got some, some you know, we've got a protocol designed around this namespace that we're going to be you know revealing or publishing you know, fairly soon in a white paper. Mm. Um, but That's exciting. The, the, yeah, I mean, there's there's some yeah there's some exciting uh, information uh, to be to be revealed at a later date. But the important thing now and the the stuff that's live now is just a general purpose namespace. Hmm. So um, right now in the OS, so the OS like indexes on this, right? When you hmm. boot, like you're indexing on this contract that has a namespace. And right now we have two like core applications that read from it. We have an indexer for the name system that hmm. lets you communicate with other nodes peer to peer. And then we have the package manager. So hmm. both of those are just reading um, data that's been pushed to the global namespace and, and basically interpreting it either as a node identity with an IP and a port or a series of routers that are going to connect you. Um, which are just themselves other node identities. Uh, and then you have the App Store, which is reading out if people have published um, app metadata hashes to the namespace, those get interpreted. The parent the parent of like the app metadata hash mm. uh, gets interpreted as an app name, and then the parent of that gets interpreted as the publisher name. Uh, it's very, you know, it's, it's hierarchical. It's like a path. Um, and, uh, and those get rendered as apps in your App Store. So mm. yeah, very simple. Um, and and yeah, pretty pretty easy to reason about. We also have, um, you know, as part of this on-chain namespace, we have some signaling tools that let us scale that across multiple chains. Now, this is all written in Solidity. It's it's again, it's live on Optimism right now. But in the future, um, as the namespace grows in size, you can imagine wanting to fracture it out across multiple chains. So you can do that as well. And then the operating system, if it wants to read that part of the namespace, has to index on that chain as well. But that's not too big of an ask because you can just use an RPC endpoint. Mm. Yeah. And 
where where is this going in terms of uh you know like uh, one thing that's interesting about about urbit is that urbit has this sort of implicit uh ideological angle and i'm not sure how much you know keynote wants to talk about this at, at this stage but obviously everyone interested in decentralized applications uh crypto in general is you know has some sort of uh ideological angle on it um and sort of the the buzz around urbit and around urbit related projects has always been this idea of, of sovereign computing um and so i just wanted to ask you a little bit about you know what does a structure like this um where people are running uh a decentralized operating system they are, they're running their own nodes they're you know publishing um uh you know, on the index and in this app store, um, what, what, what like possibility space does this enable for more sovereignty in com in computation? Yeah, well, I think it's definitely political inherently. Mm. Um, like the structure of um, of Web two is like uh, very feudal, right? Very. Mm very much a monarchy, right? You're at the whim of the owner of the servers that the website is running on. Um, so breaking it out and, and letting each user run their own web services is, you know, inherently, um, you know, it changes the political structure of the internet, mm. in my opinion, in a good way, of course. Um, now, I don't think that it is as radical uh, you know, I, I disagree with a lot of people in the decentralized peer-to-peer um, -peer server space about one thing in particular. Uh, I, and I've, you know, I'm not straw manning this because I, I've seen people express these exact beliefs. I don't think that building your own software um, is necessary to achieve sovereignty. I don't think that becoming like, you know, I think there's a there's a like a an easy like sort of like analogy to make and say like oh well if your software has a dependency on someone else's software that means you're dependent on them like, <laughs> right, very, like, right it's a very like verbal and like sort of simplistic analogy that you can make and yeah. I just don't think it holds whatsoever mm. because in practice um, like we are dependent on so much software written by so many people and, you know, uh, nothing that has been built in this, in this scene, in this space comes even remotely close to like achieving independence. And if you were to, I would argue vehemently that it would be at your own loss. I mean, seriously, like imagine a world because, you know, for better or worse, like this is like a very like right, coded um you know political space right so yeah it's right wing okay imagine a world in which uh you know our hero like jd vance or whoever you know right. is like the most tapped in right wing operative like like gets gets the american right to log on to the decentralized web servers and and live that life like awesome we have um we i mean i don't even know if i'm a part of this anymore but we have like uh, totally kneecapped ourselves in terms of capability. Like it's kind of like, you know, oh, like we're only going to communicate using like ham radio. We're going to be independent. Okay. So what yeah. you've done is made your communication substrate way, way worse than the other side. So meanwhile, they're like, like using like, you know, VR to like, you know, meld their minds and achieve like ultimate political, um, you know, convergence and achieve their goals effectively using like cutting edge software. And mm -hmm. we're like living in the woods um, using like tin cans and strings to like communicate sovereignly. Like we've, we've lowered our capacity for political action. So that's like a hypothetical world in which like software is politicized in that way. Yeah. Um, well, also, aren't you spending a tremendous amount of time like reinventing the wheel like uh yes. and yes. that's extremely yeah. effortful like the the energy costs of that are not negligible in terms of other things you could be doing <laughs> that is very true that is very true and you know it, it in practice what you see is like basically a, a an effective grift of like 
let's um i don't know i politically like i don't know if i don't know what i am thinking these days but well we don't need to take thing, a, a partisan angle on it it can sort of just yeah. be a high level well high level i'm 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 definitely frustrated by like you know desires to like get assigned power instead of just like organically earning it by being effective mm -hmm. so um what i have been working on is really just trying to use the best tool for the job um mm -hmm. for the past year or so building keynote so like we write rust and it's a it's a nice programming language there's other good programming languages to go i think go would be equally effective for this task there's wasm runtimes that are pretty good for go it's good good programming language um, I know one or two members of the team would would prefer it. Um, but like both of these are like statically compiled. It's like, okay, pull a version, open source. Yeah. The, there's nothing that can happen to the code that you have saved locally that's gonna hurt you. Um, you're you are dependent on various other pieces of software written by people who you might not even agree with politically, but like don't worry about it. it's it's really not gonna be a problem. And I would like to contribute to that code too. I think it's a it's genuinely like a, a politically neutral space in the sense that I can contribute to that. I can contribute to Rust. I can contribute to Wasm. So I'm happy to do that. I like I like what they're doing over there. Um, so so yeah. So the, the 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 part that's really meaningful though, the part that's meaningful for sovereignty is storing the data on your own machine and making peer-to-peer -peer connections and not having the middleman. That part is political and does matter. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the software level stuff is a distraction from the, the, real, the real political goal of taking coordinate, coordination power away from like a handful of companies and individuals, you mm -hmm. know? Um, again, like, you know, Elon Musk, like he's, I guess, you know, he's not a Democrat. I don't know what he is he is politically but like he's the king of twitter x i hate that name i don't like x like mm. he's the king of twitter i don't like that i didn't like it i didn't like the people that controlled it before but i don't like him being in control of it either i would much prefer to have a, a messaging protocol that's i can communicate freely between my you know followers and the people that i follow and so yeah that's the goal i mean i like farcaster i like I like Mastodon. I think there's a lot of great messaging protocols. This is another example of using the best tool for the job. With Keynode, mm -hmm. uh, we're not we're not building a messaging protocol in that in that regard. We're not building a chat app, and mm -hmm. so uh, we have a Farcaster client that's built on Keynode. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a cool that's a cool messaging tool. That's decentralized. I have some issues with the Farcaster protocol. I, I don't think it scales like awesomely, but that's that's somebody else's problem. You know, I'm not going to compete with that. But mm -hmm. you, you see what I'm getting at. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so, so yeah, so really it's more, it's more about like destructuring this client server model that's extremely yeah. hierarchical and, and sort of yeah. centralizes all of our communications in these walled gardens. Um, that's the thing that matters. And we needed that like yesterday and yeah, everything else is a distraction. We're just building to that. And, and what is the, I guess one of the, one of the big things with all of these kinds of things, uh, kinds of projects is like, yeah, they make sense for, for essentially people that are radicals, people that are technologically savvy, that are also ideologically aligned, who are interested in sovereignty for its own sake. But there's always this problem of how do you actually onboard real people? How do you actually turn this into something that could be popular? And yeah. to me, the, and, and again, I don't want to um, make this all about criticizing Urbit. I, I, Urbit's going yeah. through its own thing right now, and, and I hope that yeah. they actually succeed uh, at what they're doing. But what I would say is that one of the perennial problems uh, and, and major criticisms has been the inability to actually onboard users who are not, uh, who are not like, um, you know, top five percentile technical uh, people uh, and also ideologically aligned. Like you, you end up in this um, sort of ghetto where the only people who really care about sovereignty enough to learn these tools um, ends up being a very small proportion of people. And, and that part has partially to do with the, uh, with the usability and the approachability of, of these networks. 
Uh, and so I wanted to ask you, like, what are your thoughts on that on that problem more generally, and what what is Canode's approach? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a great question. It's an unsolved, you know, thing. I mean, we're not we're just like writing code. I, I think you know, it's still you know definitely an open question whether any of these projects can attract you know serious use. Um, so when I am trying to solve this problem, um, I, I really like the approach that Ethereum takes with this, with this issue. Mm. I mean, I would say just in general, in, in the political philosophy and the technical layer of this discussion, Ethereum is like the best possible example of like threading all of these needles. Like that is, it's, it's doing it. Um, it's doing it. Uh, like, and, and one good example of that is um, with the layer two architecture. So, you know, and there's, I'm not even trying to get into like a crypto, like blockchain architecture debate. Like there's many sides of that. Um, but look at, look at Ethereum L1 as a, as a permissionless base layer, right? Mm. It's well adopted, you know, it's not going anywhere and anybody can use it for anything that they want. You know, you have North Korean hackers are siphoning billions of dollars into their government pockets by operating on Ethereum layer one. If that's not permissionless infrastructure, I don't know what is. Talk about radical, right? Nobody can stop them. So that's pretty cool, actually. I'm not, I don't support them, but I think just in principle, it's cool. Um, meanwhile, you've got base, right? Which is like a Coinbase corporate layer two, which is like, the easiest way to like, you know, you can download Coinbase wallet and like they'll sponsor your transactions. So you don't even have to worry about gas because mm. they're paying for it because they're, a you know, a, a, a fortune 500 company or whatever that's like trying to get market share in a traditional user focused way. Mm. So Ethereum L1 doesn't have to worry about attracting users. It doesn't wor have to worry about like alien alienating non-technical people it's it's already past that hurdle because coinbase incorporated is going to take care of that problem for them using traditional web 2 methods mm -hmm. you know and i'm frankly surprised that there aren't more layer twos that are going for that highly centralized highly corporate approach i think it's a winning a winning strategy mm -hmm. uh, I, I look at like how web 2 programs have adopted have achieved adoption and it looks very similar every time they take advantage of like traditional flywheels they incentivize people they they make it completely non-technical and so you know that's how i want to that's how i want to do this that's the blueprint for me is hmm. create a permissionless base layer in the form of like keynote right get these nodes running then get the hosted version that people don't have to be technical to use and have corporations host them and pay for all the transactions and all that other nonsense completely abstract away the fact that they're on keynote um, and then, yeah, go from there and, and let them build like corporate experiences. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And then for you as a developer, like, what is it that you're most focused on? I mean, what are the hardest problems that you're, you're dealing with right now? For me, um, I mean, we've already, we've already done a lot of like good implementation stuff for networking, Ethereum, all that good stuff. Um, HTTP read and write. I, I feel pretty good about where that stuff is. It needs to be battle tested and needs to be audited. Um, the thing I'm most focused on right now is polishing the experience, um, like for the developer, uh, mm. making sure that like the base libraries are good because we want to ossify those. Uh, we want to when we release 1.0, we can't have breaking changes to the protocol. This is another thing Ethereum did really well. They launched it before it was ready, right by a by a long shot, mm. uh, but they never broke support for like something that somebody had deployed. And that's, that's I think, non-negotiable to call yourself a permissionless deployment target. Um, permissionlessness means that a developer can read your docs, build something, push the code, and never touch it again, and it still works. Mm. Like it, it, if you have to say, hey, you have to go push changes to your project that's deployed on this network, that's not a permissionless network because now you're relying on these lines of communication and you know maintenance and that's that costs money. So it's I, I would say that um, everything between now and, and keynote launch is focused around getting it to that permissionless, um, you know, no breaking changes state.
um, including the on-chain aspect, of course, but also the off-chain, you know, protocol, which includes peer-to-peer -peer messaging and, and, you know, an API for, for processes uh, mm -hmm. to hit kernel API. Um, yeah. And uh, how are things going with the launch? Um, you know, you're on 0 0.9 right now. Yeah. Um, when is that, like, can you talk about when that's expected or? Yeah, I mean, you know, as soon as possible, of course. Mm. But, um, you know, we have to get this protocol, um, you know, mm. authorized. Um, you know, we have a, we have a Swiss, um, you know, corporation that we're running our project through. And, you know, there's some regulatory aspects that have to be, you know, figured out. But um, I think we'd like to get it done. I'd like, I'd like to be, I'd like to get the OS to version 1.0 by the end of this year. So, mm -hmm. you know, next, next four months, um, three months, it's, it's been, it's been about a year of development. Um, mm -hmm. Published our first beta in January of this year. So one year from beta to, to non beta would be nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a pretty good pace for such an ambitious project. Well, I, I mean, it feels too soon, but like, again, like the, the, you know, the blueprint that Ethereum gives says to do that, you know? <laughs> right, right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to make any promises because at the same time, like I'm saying all this stuff, um, there are other considerations, right? Like mm -hmm. we have a, we have a partner um, in the form of uncentered systems. So this is an American company that's building user space apps on, on Keynote. And they're also, they have a hosting service. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of what I'm talking about with that whole Coinbase, like layer two corporate strategy. Like I'm, again, like I'm trying to follow that blueprint. I think it's a very successful blueprint. Um, if uncentered systems is building like engaging consumer products that have Keynote mm -hmm. running in the background, if they're able to do that before like the beta is, is complete, you know, if they're able to do that while we're in beta, that would allow us more wiggle room in terms of being able to polish and, and finalize the thing before we launch. I, I'm, I'm, it's an open question for me. I would like to see if we could get even more people building production stuff on the beta and then we could you know, slow it down. But my impression, like my impression a year ago was that we would need to launch 1.0 before anybody would care and mm. bother to build on us. That still might be true. Because of course, Uncentered is like a partner, you know, they, they want to build on us. They're not just a random, they're friends, you know, they're like, if we could just get people that find out about the project, they want to use it, it's useful to their crypto project or their protocol. If they could build on the beta, then I would be willing to delay like a launch, but otherwise we have to launch in order for those people to join us. So, mm. yeah. And so is developer acquisition like part of the, part of the goals? for this launch is, is like, we want to like, like build it, get people actually deciding like, Hey, I'm going to use Keynote for my crypto project. Yeah, of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's very important. Um, you're asking about, you know, user adoption. And I think developer adoption comes first mm -hmm. because, um, the platform is not useful to a user. You know, the platform right. is nothing to a, to a person who just wants to like, use the internet and communicate with people. Um, it requires developers building like polished products, you know, to get, to get users. So developers mm -hmm. yeah, first. And, and what kind of like support is there right now for like, if I decide tomorrow, like I'm going to go build, I'm going to start building a DAP on Key Keynote. Like mm -hmm. what do I find? Um, you talked a little bit in the beginning of this conversation about sort of the easy, uh, the easy install, you know, get Rust, get the package manager, yeah. get Kit. Um, where do I go from there if I was going to start building a project from scratch tomorrow? Well, you'd, you'd hop in our Discord for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we have, um, you know, pretty much 24-7 developer support because we're, we're pretty logged in. We're pretty online. Um, so, yeah, you'd, you'd join the Discord. Uh, you'd, you know, use Kit. Um, we have a bunch of examples in a book, book.keynote.org. Um, and we'll probably be adding to that over the next couple of weeks, actually. Um, but uh, yeah, you'd, you'd publish your app in beta on the App Store. Um, 
uh, one of uh, my team members, Nick, just released um, a logging library that lets you import um, a set of macros that allow you to log events inside your Keynote app. And the nice thing about the library is that um, it has telemetry. So mm. you can identify a developer node and the logging events will be pushed to that node on the network. So you can deploy this app, you can publish it in the app store, get users to download it, tell people in the Discord, hey, try this app. Um, if your app has bugs, you'll be able to figure them out by reading the logs that got telemetry back to your node. Mm. Um, now, like, I'm pretty pumped about this because every peer-to-peer -peer app, you know, on any platform I've ever written has, like, serious bugs, right? Everyone I've ever used has serious bugs. Um, being able to, uh, you know, develop in production. I mean, this is actually, like, a, a, a broad point about peer-to-peer -peer software. Um, in web, the reason Web2, maybe, maybe, this is, a you know, speculative. One of the reasons Web2 was dominant and rose to dominance was that it let you as a developer test in prod right, right? like all the great web to uh giants started by deploying to production right and then bugs would happen and they would just log into their server which is one logical server that they own they can do whatever they want with it so you can break stuff you can fix stuff right move fast break things right you can't do that with a with a protocol like you literally cannot, it's, it's horrible. I mean, it's not horrible, it's fine, but it's so much harder, you know? So back in web, like web one or pre-web, like when you were actually writing software that a user had to like put on their computer, mm. if, if it was bad software, that was it. Right. They would have to wait until they could like get the new version on a floppy disk or something and like plug it in. Um, so software was better back then. <laughs> right, because you had to get it right the first time. Yeah. And then, and then web two is like, Oh, you don't have to get it right. You can just iterate on it forever, which it turns out actually does make really, really good software. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I think actually something to strive for is the ability to do that. So then, you know, web three comes around and, and we're back to the thing where you have to deploy it once and it has to be right forever. Um, that's hard to ask, especially when you're like a small startup of like a decentralized web project that's trying to like onboard individual developers they're never going to write software that is like that level of standard, right? Mm. So we have all these tools to let people test and prod. So you have you can up you can publish a new version of an app. You can push updates over the you know Keynote network. You can do logging. You can find errors as they're happening. You can help people with that. Like this kind of stuff is what's going to make it actually viable for for developers. You know? Yeah, yeah. So really, you know, good tools for just solving bugs right like uh it's very yeah. basic stuff but it, it's totally necessary uh if you want to sort of bring this ecosystem up to the production standards of uh existing commercial software right and you know i feel that way about blockchains as well right smart contracts are really difficult to write obviously they they require like you got to get it right you got to audit your code um a version of the decentralized web that lets people move a little faster, break stuff a little bit, I think is actually very beneficial. Um, so again, you know, you return to this concept of like a permissionless base layer with mm. permissioned aspects on top that let developers play in like their sandbox. Um, you know, I want Keynote to be that kind of permissionless base layer. Um, and I want things on top of it to allow for wiggle room. And this, is, this goes back to the political concept of sovereignty as well. Um, if you have a permissionless base layer, you allow power users or technical users to assert sovereignty mm -hmm. while also providing an environment for, you know, non-technical users, or people who don't care to play and like just use it. Um, so that's, I think on chain and off chain, we need that, you know? Yeah. Well, it's also interesting because it means that, you know, in a per permission permissionless environment, um, you know, technical users the uh, the way in which they assert sovereignty is by like creating something that is that is a, that is like superior in terms of like either people want it or it does a useful function or it's some kind of innovation inside of the network uh yeah. and so in that sense it's also very meritocratic 
um, because anyone can just push anything. And like, if their idea is good and their execution is good, then more power will accrue to them. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can, you can still do stuff like there's a, there's a guy who's building uh, apps on Keynote. Um, he built an app called Dart Frog. Um, mm. His name is, um, well, it goes by many names. He's got many different usernames. Um, on, on Twitter, he's Pogarhythm. But uh, he built this app called Dart Frog. And his thesis, which is expounded in the Dart Frog app, um, mm. self-hosted thesis, is good, self-hosted manifesto, um, is that the breaking the client server model is not yeah. even the most important part of peer-to-peer -peer systems. It's simply allowing anybody to be the server in the client server model. So he takes inspiration from the days of gaming servers where you used to have anybody could run a server and mm -hmm. it would appear in the server list, right? And you you were the server for your Counter-Strike game, you know, mm -hmm. and you'd have like players would join you and that would be a peer-to-peer -peer network, but you would still be the central node. So the cent like that architecture of like one node broadcasting to many is obviously a useful architecture. It's obviously the right tool for the job in many cases. Um, He's building on Keynote, this permissionless infrastructure, he's building client server, but for games and chat rooms. It's called Dart Frog. It's a, it's a pretty cool app. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I'm, that's very, you know, that's good to see. It's really and good And I'll, I'll post the link to the Dart Frog blog post on the Keynote uh, sure. blog if people want to look, check that out further. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's all like, you know, excellent in terms of giving, you know, power back to developers and creating a, a permissionless system. Um, I was wondering, like, could you paint me a picture of like, obviously with any project like this, there's, there's a long-term, I, I wouldn't say utopian because that could be very derogatory, but there's a long-term fantastical vision for where things could go. Um, you know, when the project gets to a certain level of maturity, a certain level of adoption. And I was just wondering if you'd be willing to paint for us sort of a picture of, of the grand vision for Canode. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, so, you know, in broad strokes, um, I would say that you would have, and I don't even want to replace the current web. I just, um, I would want to have, a set of diverse experiences that only this infrastructure can offer. So unique social experiences with, of course, many, many users. Um, social experiences like, um, you know, a, an app that lets you, yes, send money between your friends, but also export entire segments of your, your social graph to like mm -hmm. from one person to another. Um, basically, like imagine if you had full access to every relational database that connected your Twitter account to the rest of the world, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to run queries on that, like and view that shape of data from any angle that you pleased, I'd like to see that on Keynote, and I'd mm -hmm. like to see that in a way that it's tapped into other networks that other people are using with with huge volumes of data. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see the ability for a user to run their own like large language models on yes, their social data, but also their financial data and their, you know, consumption data of movies and music and, and create a blended, like a tool that pulls from all of your internet activity, but in a private, you know, totally self self-controlled way. Um, I'd like to see a world in which all of those things that I just mentioned are like written and maintained by like, two, three, four people, as opposed to like a company with hundreds or thousands of devs. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very possible. Like SQLite has three, three developers, you know? It's like foundational infrastructure, like billions and billions of SQLite tables across the world. Every single thing that we use could be like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a protocol that lets you standardize a data structure that lets you feed it into your language model to give you recommendations. That could be a piece of software that's maintained by two or three people, you know? And that could pull from like Farcaster plus Twitter plus whatever the next social media is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, by the way, in, 
in, in terms of getting to this future, I think vampire attacks are like a very useful tool. I think like there will be an intermediary phase where like you as a keynote user will get data from centralized services and you'll pull it in and you'll do stuff with it. By the way, that was like an OG Urbit vision that just never happened because of like software reasons. But like that's still a good idea. Um, that's still going to happen. So we're going to get that. We're going to vampire attack the data and let you run your own analysis on it. Let you like do stuff like a layer two on top of Twitter data. Um, Uncentered Systems is working on that already. Um, but yeah, lots of like novel interaction patterns um, maintained by like very few developers per project. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to see like new models of value accrual to these protocols. So I love what people are doing with tokens. You know, mm. I think tokens are great. Um, they let developers like make money off of software that didn't used to make money. There's a bunch of like cool infrastructure that's being built because it'll eventually have a token. They're raising tons of money and doing cool stuff. It's bad for like retail investors in the current model because of like market reasons. But fundamentally, the idea of like being able to throw a token out there uh, and attach it to your little piece of software is very, very cool. So I want app developers to make like doing that for your application that you put on the Keynote App Store should be as easy as like, you know, adding telemetry to your logging, right? And that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the keynote future for sure is more protocols, more token apps, um, more apps, less developers per app. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, well, I hope that we do see a keynote future uh, uh, soon. Um, Thank you. Ben, uh, it's been great having you on. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and talking about keynote. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this was fun. And uh, is there any um, just uh, final words to say about how people can get involved in Keynote if they're interested in contributing uh, or, or developing? Um, where should people go? Like, what is sort of the central hubs for getting uh, getting your hands in the project? Well, definitely, you know, hop in the Discord. Um, we're very active there. Eventually, it'll be self-hosting, but I don't want to, you know, force that on people yet. Um, maybe never, I don't know. Um, but get in the discord. Um, we post on Twitter, um, on dart frog. Yeah. I mean, message me directly, you know, I happy to talk. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Ben, thanks so much. All right. Thank you for having me, Alex. See ya.